It's recorded. Yeah. Bonjour à tous et à tous. Je suis Natasha Bart et uh, je suis professeur à la faculté de droit de l'Université d'Ottawa. J'aimerais vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cet événement conjoint sponsorisé par la Pierre Greenberg et la série de conférences sur le droit de l'environnement. Avant de commencer, je veux reconnaître que l'Université d'Ottawa est située sur le territoire concédé des peuples algonquins. Many of us are uninvited guests here, and I know that I am grateful to the Algonquin people, the traditional guardians of this land. Our recognition and acknowledgement of traditional Algonquin territory is a small step toward our ongoing efforts at reconciliation. Reconciliation is, of course, something that continues. The word as a verb necessitates a commitment to developing the law in a manner that colonizes it. So I say the land acknowledgement in the hope that we will take seriously its many implications. I'm so pleased to introduce our special guest today. Lindsay Burroughs is an assistant professor at Queen University's Faculty of Law, where she teaches special topics in the field of Indigenous law. Professor Burroughs has a bachelor's from Dartmouth College, a JD from the University of Victoria, and an LLM from the University of Alberta. He has worked as a lawyer and a researcher at the Indigenous Law Research Unit at the University of Victoria's Faculty of Law, and as a staff lawyer at West Coast Environmental Law. In both positions, she provided legal support to Indigenous communities and organizations engaged in the re revitalization of their own laws for application in contemporary contexts. She's particularly passionate about the possibilities within brand based legal education. And since 2014, she has co facilitated various on the land, community engaged Anishinaabe law camps in partnership with different law schools and communities across Ontario. Her book, Otter's Journey Through Indigenous Language and Law published by UBC Press, explores the connection between language and law. Professor Burroughs is Anishinaabe and a member of the Chippewas of Nawash First Nation. Many of you in first year will be familiar with Professor Burroughs' writing. Her incredibly insightful article on humility is part of one of your calls to action modules. In her presentation today, Professor Burroughs will share some stories from her grandmother, Jean Burroughs' fascinating life to show how sites of Indigenous legal education are also an essential part of the Canadian Legal Academy. Jean Burroughs' varied life experiences provided her with a type of legal knowledge that led her to become an influential educator of Anishinaabe law including as an elder at the land-based Anishinaabe law camps hosted regularly in her community. And wonderfully, Professor Burroughs' grandmother is joining us today through our online platform. So welcome, Elder Burroughs. And let me turn it over now to Professor Lindsay Burroughs. Thank you. Thank you, miigwech, merci for that wonderful introduction. And I'm so grateful to be here with you all today. And I haven't been to Ottawa since I was, I think, 13 years old. So it's exciting to be back here. And I have my three and a half year old and one and a half year old in tow with me this time. So the seasons bring great changes in our lives. And I hope that through this presentation, through sharing some of these stories about my grandmother, you reflect on the seasons in your life too. And think about those elders or matriarchs or community mentors who have helped you to 
uh, think about what it is that's most important in your life and helps give you the strength to be resilient through the hard times that inevitably come. So uh, to begin with, I want to share a story about my grandmother, Jean. And I'm pressing forward on here. Okay, I'll let Natasha help me out with that. Thank you. Um, so this introductory story took place uh, back in 2014 in my community, the Chippewas of Naywash First Nation. So uh, my reserve is about three hours north of Toronto, and it is on the shores of Georgian Bay. And back in 2014, Osgood uh, Hall Law School began offering land-based, community-engaged Anishinaabe law camps as a way to introduce law students contextually to Indigenous law. So recognizing that beautiful teachings can sometimes come in this type of format where we're at the law school and there's these walls around us and uh, we have no windows, but instead we have one another to learn from. But the purpose of these law camps was to recognize that we can also learn from the land around us, that we can learn in different ways when we sit with one another in the evenings around a fire. Uh, when we hear those kind of in-between stories about what people are thinking about and where they've come from. And so these law camps were a way to bring that type of learning forward. And on the final day uh, of, our, of this particular camp, we gathered in a closing circle. And it was an opportunity to hear people reflect about their experiences and what they learned and uh, maybe what challenged them or how they're going to move forward. And thinking about this hard work of reconciling legal traditions, because here we had all of these law students engaged in learning about Canadian law. And uh, we had to think through, well, how does Anishinaabe law connect with this? How does it diverge? And what were these different ways that we learned about law through, thank you, through uh, going out and helping people in the gardens, in their gardens, or through going out on the canoes or going swimming or going on a plant walk or beating with one another or listening to stories uh, presenting. These are some of the many types of activities that we engaged in together. And it was very special sitting in the closing circle. I hope the image gives you a little sense of what the community hall looked like. It's basically a gym. And we had these uh, sort of metal chairs that we sat around in. And as we shared, people put forward beautiful, heartfelt reflections on what the, this experience being introduced to Anishinaabe law meant to them. And as this was going on, a man named Alan came in and I've changed his name for privacy reasons. And Alan had not yet been a part of the camp, but all people were welcome to come in as they pleased. And so we welcomed him into the circle. But instead of taking a seat, uh, around in, in the circle, he came right up to my father, Professor John Boros, who was uh, sharing a closing song called Wei Wen It, the Travel Well song. And he got within inches of his face, and it became quickly apparent that he was um, controlled by a substance, likely alcohol, and he was very volatile and he was very angry. And he looked like he was going to punch my dad. And for me sitting there, um, I was a law student at the, or I was an article student at this particular time. And I felt very worried. And not only did I feel worried for my dad, but I felt this disharmony between all of this sharing that was happening in the circle that was so positive and um, hopeful. And then to see this kind of anger come into the room. And after what was probably only one or two minutes, but it felt like much longer, one of the fire keepers uh, came in and he was engaged in some of the ceremonial work of the camp. And he gently put his arm around Alan and escorted him out of the community hall. 
And my grandma, Jean Boros, then stood up. And the, the feeling in the room was very tense. And me personally, uh, I was looking for comfort and assurance. And I was on edge. My nervous system was so open. And she immediately started sharing how proud she was of Alan. And she shared that he was a residential school survivor who was one of the first people in our particular community who was talking openly about some of the very serious harms that he had faced there. And not everyone wanted to hear about this. I think a big trauma response uh, is sometimes just to shut those stories down and not want to hear about it. But Alan was someone who was talking about this um, from the very early stages. He had lost so many family members to uh, suicide, uh, to alcohol abuse, to drug abuse, yet he was someone who chose to face the world each day with a measure of hope. Uh, he chose to stay alive, and in this particular instance, he chose to come into the hall and be around people. And as she shared about his life, she also commented on who he was related to within the circle. And uh, Jean is someone who I would describe as a genealogy expert. She has this mind like dominoes when she describes someone walking by on the road in the community. She can say who their grandparents were, their great grandparents, how it connects to her aunt and uncle, and she, she just can weave together this image of how we're related to one another in a really profound way, so profound that I've often tried to draw or sketch out what she shared, but it eludes my uh, artistic capacities. And so Jean did this work for us. And as I mentioned, I was an article student at the time uh, through the Law Society of British Columbia. And I had just months earlier gone, I was working in a legal aid clinic for a secondment in downtown Victoria. And I was representing a client who had been, who had pled guilty for several criminal charges. And as part of my task during that sentencing submission was to invite the judge into an understanding of my client's life. And drawing on glad to sentencing principles, he was a Tsim Shan man, indigenous from a small community in the northwest corner of the province. His father had gone to residential school in Edmonton, which is over a thousand kilometers away. Um, he was someone who had had a very challenging upbringing. And in sharing these stories, I was trying to bring to light for the judge why it is that he ended up there. and. Um, the glad you principles, of, of course, have a lot more depth and uh, purpose to it than that. But I was drawing connections in my mind as I heard my grandmother talking about Alan and how she so expertly gave this submission such that we in the circle would be able to form judgments and make meaning and walk away from that experience in a way that gave us uh, something to hang on to and I think of the late elder Basil Johnson, who lived down the road from uh, my grandma and my aunt, who's also on the call here today. And he would often say that it's when someone has done something wrong, that it's in that moment that they most need to be reminded of their capacity for goodness. And my grandmother really brought that forward for him. And it's I share this story because it's something I've seen many times over the years. This wasn't a one-off experience. And in uh, 2012, I had the opportunity to co-write this Anishinaabek Legal Traditions Report through the Accessing Justice and Reconciliation Project. And I want to highlight some of the principles that were identified in this report and how it connects back to the story of law in the community hall. So this report uh, took place while the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was doing their important work around how to 
move forward in a healing way from the deep harms that occurred during the residential school era. And as part of this, they were curious, well, how do indigenous legal traditions deal with harms that occurred between communities? How can we draw on not just Canadian law to move forward through these harms, but identify these principles from indigenous legal traditions? And so through this project, we partnered with six different nations across the country, and the Chippewas of Nawas First Nation, where Jean is a, a member, a citizen, was one of the partner communities. And so using the narrative method of drawing out law from stories, myself and uh, Hannah Askew, who's now the executive director of the BC chapter of the Sierra Club, uh, we spent the summer living in my grandma and grandpa and auntie's home. And we read all sorts of Anishinaabe stories and we talked to knowledge keepers and elders and community members about what these stories teach us about law. So we think about case briefing in Canadian law school, how you identify the issue, the facts, the decisions, the reasons. Uh, this is essentially how we were approaching these stories as a real legal resource, as an intellectual tool, uh, as an opportunity to think through how it is that we can pattern our lives and make decisions in relationship to those patterns. And we identified these six principles uh, that I've included here. There are many others, but these are just the ones that came forward to me. So Jean showed through her submission the importance of education. Uh, she wanted to make sure that we had the appropriate knowledge about Alan so that we could form, it could inform our judgment of what that situation was and what was happening there. Uh, the responsibility to help those in need. So recognizing, I think in this case, that all of us had different needs. Those of us in the circle, many of us were feeling quite tense after this experience, as well as Alan was in deep need of help. Uh, the responsibility to protect the group from harm. She recognized Alan's right to be helped and the right to be treated with dignity and compassion. And then this final point was a general underlying principle that was identified through this report of the Anishinaabe legal tradition, which is that people are fundamentally good but have trouble following through with their good intentions. So again, thinking back to that idea that it's when people have done something wrong, it's at that moment that perhaps we have an obligation to remind them of their capacity for goodness. And through that kind of lens, um, some of that rehabilitation and reintegration work can happen more deeply. So while we had talked about Anishinaabe law throughout that camp, uh, I think we also were so privileged to witness it in action multiple times, including through this example. And I note that the firekeeper that day did something really special and I could focus on, on his story. I also think about um, how the next day after this happened, Alan came and joined us all for breakfast. Uh, he sat with different members of the community at one of the tables and there were students peppered in there too. And he was able to enjoy that as well as the people who were there were able to enjoy his company as well. So I don't know what happened that night. Uh, that will forever remain a mystery to me, I think. But I imagine that some caretaking took place and that he was attended to. And that through that kind of action, there was healing that happened. And I think it's beautiful that sometimes healing can happen overnight. Often it's intergenerational uh, or at least one person's lifetime if you're lucky. Um, but in, in that case, he was able to, to come back. So uh, the talk that I'm giving today is focused on a paper that I've recently written and I'm in the process of editing about Jean's <laughs> contributions to the Canadian Legal Academy. And the question I'm asking here through examining Jean Boros's life is, well, what is the Canadian Legal Academy? If Indigenous legal traditions are an integral component of the legal landscape here in Canada, 
how does it relate to the Indigenous Legal Academy? Uh, are these separate streams or do they interweave with each other? Is it both? Um, and then I think through how has Jean in particular, or I answer this question through the lens of Jean's life. And uh, I have a couple photos here of, this is the Assiniwetu Winnawag community in Northern Alberta. I took these photos this summer because I'm doing my PhD right now through the University of Alberta. So this was one of my courses that I took. It was a week long intensive moose hide tanning camp. And through tanning these hides and engaging with this deep land-based knowledge that the Assiniwetu Winnawag have, uh, we were able to understand more about their legal principle of Wakotawin, which is about relationships and obligations between uh, beings, human and more than human. And the late elder Adelaide McDonald is the one who was really able to start up these camps. She was an expert hide tanner. And I think about Adelaide McDonald as uh, another person who I'm not sure how her story will go down as a contributor to the Canadian Legal Academy. Yet here she was bringing, um, at this point, she probably had about 50 different people from the University of Alberta come and learn in her community through her descendants who are continuing to practice those high tanning skills. Um, so there's a couple pictures here. As I was thinking about this question of the interaction between the Canadian Legal Academy and the Indigenous Legal Academy, and I have a spider web and a two-row wampum as just two potential images to, to think of and what do they offer us. So the two-row wampum is where I'll start, but wampums are an important part of some Indigenous uh, legal expression. We can think about it as a form of written law, and it's a mnemonic device or a storytelling device to remind us of treaties or agreements that have been made between nations. And this particular two-row wampum was uh, back in the early 1600s. It was uh, made between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Dutch. And the general idea of this treaty is that the Dutch had proposed to the Haudenosaunee that they would exist in a, a father-son type relationship, a patriarchal relationship. And the Haudenosaunee said, no, we'll be more like brothers. Um, uh, they, they proposed something that's a bit more equal. And they express this here as two canoes. So you have these two rows of purple beads and the two canoes are traveling in the same waters in the same river, but they're not interfering with one another. They're giving deference and respect to the way that other canoe is traveling through that space. And then the white beads symbolize peace, friendship, and respect. And you'll see that there's three big rows of white beads, and then each of the white beaded rows has three little rows. So peace, friendship, respect, um, multiplied throughout this treaty expression. And so I, as I think about this, I think sometimes this is how the Canadian Legal Academy and the Indigenous Legal Academy are operating. Um, there are times when there are these two pathways and they're not engaging in that interaction. But then I also think that so often it's this more this spider web uh, effect where we have so many relationships after these hundreds of years of living here and we are entangled with one another and there is so much beauty in this entanglement even as there's a huge mess in the entanglement and uh, as I am working my way thinking about this through Jean's life I the, the spider web image keeps coming back to me in a strong way because I see how time and again, she is so enmeshed and so tangled with many different types of teachings, even as these uh, teachings of the Anishinaabe legal tradition have guided her since she was a child. So I'd like to get into some of the stories now uh, of my grandmother. 
And I think to the final point as a way of framing some of these stories that I'll share over the next half an hour is what is this theory of law that I'm working with? Now, I'm someone who uh, is not a legal theory expert, and I find whenever I read these big pieces on legal theory, I have to talk about it for a long time, and then the more I talk about it, the less I feel I understand. Um, so as I'm figuring this out, one of the theories I'm thinking about is the ways that law can be performed in deliberative, I wonder if I can put this down. In deliberative, informal, implicit, decentralized, and flexible ways. So many, if not most, indigenous legal traditions are non-state traditions. And so if there isn't this same kind of appeal to the state or the same kind of hierarchy, uh, it's more deliberative, informal, implicit, decentralized, and flexible. Uh, how is it that law can be framed? And I find the work of the late legal theorist, Roderick McDonald, very helpful. He was at McGill and he wrote this lovely little piece called Everyday Law. And in that, he is thinking about the ways that all of us engage as legal actors in the world. And that uh, through the individual, we, we understand particular ways of how it is that we should be living. And through that effect of all of us engaging in these day-to-day -day acts, it uh, creates a type of body of law that is uh, something that has real force in the world. And I think about Jean as someone who has been a child, a hunter, an angler, a farmer, a childcare worker, a cleaner, a cook, a mother, a hat shop owner, a computer technician, as she worked for the Avro Aero back when Canada was big into space exploration for a period. Um, she was a seminary teacher for her church, a real estate agent, which she was able to do when she lost her status when she married my uh, Yorkshire grandfather, but we'll get to that in a moment. She was a, a protester, a board member, a salesperson, and a grandmother. And so, you know, these are titles that we may not normally think of as legal uh, teacher or law professor. Uh, and so this journey now I'm about to take you on is one that shows how this has led her into a professor of Anishinaabe law. Um, so here are just a few other words I think of when I think about what laws are. They're standards, principles, processes, criteria, measures, indicia, benchmarks, precedent, guides, intellectual and cultural resources, regulations, rules, and codes. And all of these have the purpose of helping us to solve problems, resolve conflict, make collective decisions, create safety, maintain or repair rela relationships, and act on our responsibilities to one another. Um, so here's a picture of my grandmother and her sister, my great auntie Norma, at one of the Anishinaabe law camps. And so they were present throughout these camps, uh, sharing teachings and stories for students. And as I was putting the photos together for this presentation, it was really exciting because I look at people in the photos, and this is now a decade later, and we, I still know what a lot of them are up to. So in the middle between uh, Grandma Jean and Auntie Norma, in the back there is Erica Stahl, who's now a lawyer at Mandel Tinder, practicing Aboriginal law in Vancouver, and also a, a new mother. So Jean was born on April 11th, 1937 in Los Angeles. So her um, father, Josh Jones, during the depression, he tells the, he, I never met my great grandfather, but lots of people, he's a very storied individual. Lots of people tell stories about him. And the story goes that he uh, was heading to town to buy bread. And as he was walking, the store in town didn't have bread. And so he went to the next town still didn't have bread and he went to the next town and suddenly he was in Los Angeles. And uh, while he was there, he met Yuna 
Evelyn Page, who was my uh, great grandmother. And she was a seamstress working for Universal Studios. And um, the, the two of them met one another and Josh used to joke that they switched from being actors uh, and a seamstress as my great grandpa went down there to be a stuntman Indian in the Hollywood cowboy and Indian film. And he got paid a few dollars every time he was shot and fell off a horse. Um, so he made good money there and Yuna was making good money as a seamstress. And they, he joked that they became, they switched from being uh, actors to becoming producers. They produced Joan Lois and then Bobby, and then uh, Shirley, and then Jean was number four, and then Billy, and then the, or I think the twins went first, Norma Ann and Norman, and then Billy, and then Howard. And so they had eight children, and my grandma was smack dab in the middle of them. And they enjoyed a comfortable life uh, in Los Angeles. But when my grandmother was four years old, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And there was a lot of suspicion at the time of people who were racialized. And my great grandfather didn't feel safe being there uh, with the family. And so they decided to pack up the truck and put all their belongings in the back and the four kids into the cab. And they drove from Los Angeles up to Neoshinigning or the uh, Chippewas of Neowash Reserve. And when they arrived, there's a woman who was uh, a writer and she captured this in a book that she published. Um, but they, they had a moose meat stew feast uh, when they came and my grandmother tells of the different places they stopped along the way. She was only four years old at the time, but she remembers going to the Painted Desert uh, in, I think that's in New Mexico, in the Petrified Forest in Arizona. She remembers stopping in Oklahoma to visit some of those friends that her parents had made through the film industry. And when they got back to, to Neoshinigming, they had all of these fun toys <laughs> from their time in Los Angeles. And so my grandma says, you would think that Hollywood came to Neoshinigming through that trunk of uh, belongings and clothing and regalia that had been brought up with them. And uh, my grandmother really enjoyed getting to connect with her uh, different relatives for the first time as a four-year-old. So in the top picture, those are my great, great grandparents, Charles Gikinos Jones and Ella Jones. And then um, my great grandparents, Josh and Yuna, the seamstress and the stuntman. And then my grandmother and my grandfather, Joe. Um, this is my grandma when she was young with my dad when he was little, my great grandpa with my auntie Jenny when she was little. So as a four year old, um, my grandma didn't speak any Anishinaabe Moen. Her first four years of life in Hollywood, Hollywood and Los Angeles, they uh, spoke English. And she said that when she remembers as a little child coming back home and not being able to communicate with her cousins and some of her aunts and uncles and feeling a sense of isolation from that. Uh, yet she also knew that they loved her deeply. And fairly shortly after, she began attending the Indian Day School on the reserve along with her cousins and siblings. And these Indian Day Schools were founded with the same purpose of residential schools to assimilate uh, Indigenous people and to kill the Indian in them. And... Um, my grandmother attended this Indian day school from 1943 until 1951. And uh, the largest class action suit or settlement that's happened in Canada was related to residential schools. And that was how the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was formed. But there is also a class action more recently for these Indian day schools, uh, recognizing the harms that these children faced, even as they were allowed to go home to their families in the evening. And this is a place that my grandma didn't tell me many stories about. 
And in preparing to write this paper, I was given her, um, I think maybe it's called an affidavit, her, her claim uh, when she applied to that class action settlement as an Indian Day School survivor. And I couldn't read it because uh, it's just too hard for me to hear those stories. And so this was uh, a part of my grandma's life coming back here. So here we think about Los Angeles and this fear around the bombing of Pearl Harbor and what was unfolding with um, the war and the racism at that time. And they come home and uh, unfortunately, they're not able to es escape. They haven't come home to uh, a safe place necessarily. So one day my grandma tells the story, she was at the Indian day school and was looking outside and she saw smoke off in the distance. And she went home and saw that that smoke that she saw during the day at school was her house and it had burned down. And so all of their things from Los Angeles were gone. Uh, all of their possessions in the world. And this was a really traumatic time that led to my grandfather, my great grandfather and great grandma sending all of the children to different family members' homes in the community. And then they went down to Detroit as a, a way to get money. And eventually they were able to uh, come back and my grandma describes these many instances in her childhood of when a real hardship would happen and the kids would end up in different people's homes, that this was the insurance plan being activated. The sense of uh, being a member of a community, you have obligations to one another and you can expect that others will take care of you. And her stories show the way that she was both a recipient of so much help and care and teachings and love through all of these hard times. And likewise, she lived her life in a way where she gave that back. And as she became a mother, eventually, they had a very open door policy where they had different people staying and living with them for long stretches of time. And my grandma describes this as such a gift, as such a joy that she was able to have all sorts of these young people come through her home in times of need. So while my uh, grand, at one point, they all went down to Detroit to try and uh, keep working. And my grandfather, contract, my great grandfather contracted tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is a disease that has affected indigenous people at hugely disproportionate rates. And so when that happened, he went into a sanitarium and my great grandmother took all eight of the kids back up to uh, Canada, back up to Nashinigme. And my grandma said she remembers, she's seven years old at this time, she remembers leaving her dad and thinking he was just going to be gone. That that was her last time seeing him and he was on his path to death. And so she lived her life from age seven until age uh, 17 without seeing her father and essentially thinking he was dead. And then as a 17 year old, uh, he came back. And so you can imagine just what that would feel. I can't even really imagine what that would feel like. And um, meanwhile, without a father, Jean had to engage in the work of living. And part of this was learning how to sustain themselves from the earth. And so here I have a picture of a chickadee because she tells fondly the stories of friendships that she made with the chickadees. When her older brother Bobby was teaching her how to snare rabbits, the chickadees knew that there would be little bits of meat left in the snares. And so they would follow her and her brother as they would go on this, uh, go out snaring. And whenever they were out on their different food journeys, whether it was fishing or otherwise, it seemed that the black capped chickadees were always there. And my sister, uh, Megan, her Anishinaabe name is Chik Chik uh, Chigadese from the chickadee. And uh, my grandmother learned from these different beings, again, going back to that legal traditions report, the proposition that humans and non-humans are part of one community with mutual obligations. The earth is animate, including rocks and trees, as well as, of course, different animals and um, other plants and water. The proposition that some laws come from the land itself and should be learned by being out on the land. 
And so because of this experience, these deep experiences growing up, completely surviving from her home, Jean's understanding of what should be allowed uh, in the community takes into account those many different beings who live there. And just as there was that insurance plan between people, there's also an insurance plan, if, if you wanna put it that way, with the earth itself. If you don't take care of those beings, then they're not going to be there to take care of you in times of need. And uh, today, you know, you can go to the grocery store and we put up thinking about the walls. Again, we put up all these walls that kind of disconnect us from um, how it is that we survive on this planet. And they serve to uh, obscure the gratitude that perhaps we should be feeling at every step when we turn on the tap. What a miracle that we can turn on the tap and have water. So um, one of Jean's great teachers was her great grand, no, her grandfather, my great, great grandfather, Charles Giganos Jones, who was born sometime in the early 1800s. I can't remember right now, but I love the sense when we have elders in our life, they connect us through the elders in their life over 200 years. And I can't believe that my, one of my best friends, my grandma, one of her best friends was this man who was born in the early 1800s. And uh, I think that's a really special connection and thinking about our law professors. Um, he is someone who really taught her how to live well. Um, I don't have time to share this story, but I want to take these last couple minutes here before we'll open up for any questions or comments or discussion to talk specifically about how this now transitioned into these Anishinaabe law camp offerings. So, so far, I've more been talking about my grandmother's experience within this uh, Anishinaabe Legal Academy. And now here is the intersection with the Canadian Legal Academy. So in 2014, Andre Boissel, a law professor at Osgoode Hall Law School, uh, came over to visit different people in the community because she really wanted to, she thought the students and herself would just love having this opportunity to learn Indigenous law in context. And she had done a lot of her PhD work with the Stalo, and as a part of that had done a field school through um, a school in Chilliwack, British Columbia, that I can't remember the name of right now, but she had an, an immersive and wonderful experience in that field school, which was history focused, uh, but learning about Stalo ways of life. And so this idea was received warmly. Um, Professor Signa Don Shanks was a, a participant and contributor to these camps as well. And they were operating very annually up until the pandemic when everything shut down and now they're being revitalized. And it's so exciting because they're happening in all sorts of communities. They're taking place uh, at Walpole Island and at the Chippewas of the Thames and the Chippewas of Rama. Um, so we see that this is expanding and rippling out. And uh, at first when these Anishinaabe law camps were formed, the TRC hadn't quite yet issued their reports and their calls to action. But by the following year, in 2015, we had this call to action number 28, calling upon law schools in Canada to require all law students to take a course uh, related to Aboriginal people and the law, including the legacy of residential schools, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, treaties, uh, Aboriginal Crown relations. And suddenly this uh, law camp became a model for one piece of the puzzle to bringing this call to action into, into life, breathing life into it. And I'll pause on this photo because here, this woman in the purple sweater, that is Justice Patricia Hennessy of the Ontario Superior Court. And she was on leave that year uh, doing education. And Justice Hennessy, after that, has now been hearing this huge uh, treaties case 
uh, in, on the North Shore of Lake Huron. And this was her, she describes it as her first formal introduction to learning about Anishinaabe law. And now here she spent, oh, I don't even know how many hours and days immersed in Anishinaabe legal understandings of the Robinson Huron and Robinson Superior treaties as she's been in that court setting. And so we can see how these types of camps are important for law students in their future because Justice Hennessy certainly didn't know that case would come across her path. And now um, she, she probably knows more than me about Anishinaabe law. She's had incredible teachers as witnesses have come forward uh, throughout this, this case. So my grandmother was once invited by uh, Donis Kennedy, an uh, Anishinaabe lawyer, to speak at the Indigenous Bar Association Conference. And my grandma said, oh, I couldn't do that. I'm just an encourager of people. And Donna said, exactly. That's exactly what we need. And I think about that as now I'm a new professor of law uh, at Queen's University. And I think, oh, I I want to follow this example of my grandmother, one of my greatest law professors, and to be an encourager of people. And I think that uh, in providing opportunities to uh, connect with one another, we can recognize what it is that we're missing in our own lives and we recognize our own strengths. I think we learn so much by being in relationship with one another. And through this act of encouraging is one way that we can uh, bring out a, uh, speaking of reconciliation, a, a more just world, a more reconciled space. And uh, in thinking about the Anishinaabe Legal Academy or more broadly, the Indigenous Legal Academy and the Canadian Legal Academy, I hope we find lots of spaces of encouragement across these traditions so that we can come to be the best of best version of ourselves, um, both internally, but also externally in these spaces of relationality. Um, so in conclusion, there's, uh, I could talk about all these people. This, one of the young men in this picture is Scott Franks, who's now a professor of indigenous law at Toronto Metropolitan University. He was a first year law student at the time of this camp. Um, we have, Let's see, I think, Signa, you're in the back. <laughs> forehead. Yeah, your forehead's there. And you're next to Robert Hamilton, who at the time was a graduate student, and he is now a professor at the University of Calgary, and he's teaching uh, their version of the mandatory course uh, related to Indigenous law. So we see that, you know, from these small and simple seeds and beginnings, we grow and we ripple out and um, th there's so much, I just have so much gratitude for what it is that Jean has shared with me. And if we ask Jean how we can ensure Indigenous women are increasingly recognized as part of the legal academy, she might say with a twinkle in her eye, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so that brings me to the conclusion of my presentation today. And I would love to hear any sorts of um, comments that you might have. And I do invite you, there's snacks here that have been generously provided. So perhaps during this question period might be a perfect time if you wanted to get up and grab some snacks and return and we can have an informal conversation here. Miigwech bizindawye, thank you for the time. Yeah. Hi. Um, Sorry for the delay, I was in class, but um, I'm a master's student and my research paper basically wants to illustrate the importance of early jurisprudence. Uh, so I would love to know your comments on how early jurisprudence or provisions uh, to special rights in nature to enforce um, indigenous communities' rights. Because uh, so far I read that uh, there is a connection, of course, between nature and uh, indigenous communities and their rights, um, since they advocate for the for the protection of nature. So I would love to uh, know your comments on this um, relationship, because for me it's really clear. <laughs> but when I want to write about it, make it clear for everyone to read it, hard. Yeah. So I would love to know. 
That's a great question. I, I'd love to know more about your work. And one of the ideas that comes to my mind is thinking about the treaty relationships as an example of early jurisprudence. And so we see in some of those treaty negotiations, one of the phrases that was used was the treaties were meant to last as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the river flows. And so here we have an example of uh, thinking about how long the treaties are meant to last in order to understand that, we need to understand how long the sun shines, how the grass grows, how the river flows. And so there is inherent in this kind of a looking to the earth. Uh, and the earth is kind of called upon as a way for us to interpret these legal agreements. I also think about, uh, I'll plug some of the work of the Indigenous Law Research Unit at the University of Victoria as well as West Coast Environmental Law, where they've been working on these reports, articulating uh, in English in kind of a trans-systemic format, some of these environmental principles. And so in there, there's examples of the stories and the people who uh, from earlier times have shared what these types of rights of nature arguments are. So those are a couple of examples. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I hope this question is, is well formed. Um, so I, I feel like I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, law as narrative. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the choices that judges make in telling stories and how that shapes often what their outcome is gonna be or how they're gonna mm -hmm. kind of draw principles. Um, and so while you were talking about your grandmother's amazing life and her effect on so many people, and I was thinking, well, in a way, choosing to draw her narrative through law is a, is a choice that might change certain things. And I was thinking there are so many ways that you could approach this complex life, right? You could call it history, call it life, right? And you could call it so many things. And I wondered yeah. if you had more to say about how choosing to interpret it as law highlighted or, or changed some of your interpretations? Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And stories are so fast and so fluid and um, so slippery. I think I, in my paper, I kind of describe this as suspending, uh, putting some, some uh, so if you think about a spider web again, how spider webs, sometimes you can't see them at all if the light isn't right. And I think likewise with stories, sometimes we just don't see them or we, we don't interpret them or we miss, we miss things. But then in certain lights, they come to us and we see it. And with spider webs in particular in the winter time, uh, when they become frozen and they look incredible and it's suspended in all of its glory and intricacy in that moment. And as I was thinking about sharing my grandmother's story, I felt like I was just sharing this one seasonal moment. Like it's this winter of her life right now as an elder. And then I'm in my season and we're interacting and uh, sharing this forward. And so what I wish could happen is that so many people could interact with Jean's story and then uh, likewise, that we could be telling other individual people's stories and through kind of layering them onto one another, we'd have a more complex view. But I think at the root of it is I'm, I'm, I think with story, like we're not really seeking for the true story, we're seeking for one telling of it. And I think about the Debuewin, which is the Anishinaabe word for truth, which is also one of the seven grandparent teachings, which are these ethical guidelines for how to live. But I've been taught that Debuewin, truth literally means like truth in so far as you can know it. Um, so the sense that it's not this objective reality for everyone, but it's this, the truth in so far as I know it. Um, so those are some initial thoughts that come. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Signa. Um, so wonderful to have you here, Lindsay. I um, maybe it's because of some similar brainstorming I'm doing. Um, I I I don't know if you have a similar reaction to when <laughs> um, of the circumstances and taking them as laws 
but I, I wonder if sometimes when people are newer to being part of circles where this happens is that um, something that's not appreciated is that there are consequences mm. to the to the whatever word we give them the standards or the rules or something and so that's why at least I might consider them laws is because um, there might be different ways of understanding those moments and there's enough space for that to happen that's perfectly fine it doesn't mean it's not true mm -hmm. but that I'm going to take that as seriously as a stop sign right. or um, a, a case from the Supreme Court of Canada because I appreciate that if I don't keep to the, the guidance the standards that there's there's going to be consequences mm -hmm. that could harm the place I'd like to have in those circles I Right. Anyway, yeah, I love that insight. And it makes me think about uh, when I was articling for the Tsilko team. And as part of what I was, I was working for an environmental legal organization. And when we partnered with them, they said, okay, we're going to need a boat and horses. And we're going to go out on the land. And that's how you're going to learn about some of our environmental laws. You need to learn about this like in context and relationship. And as part of it, we were immediately introduced to this mountain named Silos, who's one of their ancestors. And they said to my colleague and I, you cannot point at Silos because if you do or show any disrespect to Silos, then uh, you could, if you point, you'll lose your finger. Um, if you speak loudly or boisterously or leave something behind that you're not meant to there, it will cause bad weather. And she, Alice told us stories of people who had died because of that. And so the consequences of this were huge. And uh, my colleague and I have terrible sense of, of direction. And so we thought, oh, no, what if we accidentally point at the mountain and we didn't even know it was the mountain? Um, but thinking about the consequences for them of doing this act is something that most people moving through that territory don't know anything about. And I find that so interesting because I, I guess it's not really an answer, it's just a further reflection of thinking about Indigenous law as people who are not going to be able to be invited into an understanding of it at all times. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to inevitably make mistakes in those territories and disrespect those ancestors? And uh, what do we do with that? And what if we don't even recognize where the consequences are flowing from? So yeah, further, further reflections that flow. Well, thank you so much. It's a really important, incredibly inspiring paper. And thank you so much for coming to share it with us. I was just wondering how you feel about, to me, the case for the web of connection and sharing between, you know, the established conventional legal academy and digital legal academy is so crystal clear. We should be doing this every day. <laughs> but I was wondering how you feel about indigenous legal principles being imported into settler law and specifically I'm thinking about litigation. Um, mm -hmm. Sarah Morales and I wrote this paper about Thomas and Rio Tinto, which is where a First Nation is using nuisance law to protect their territory because section 35 had thus far failed them. Right. And we argued that indigenous legal principles should be used to understand what an unreasonable interference is yeah. in that context. But then I know other people are very uncomfortable with the idea of because you're still in that box, like it's still settler law and you have to meet this test that was established in England. Yeah. Um, but is it better than not enriching that understanding that the relevant indigenous people? Yes, that's such, it's such a sticky <laughs> point. And we're seeing different strategies from different nations in approaching this, where some are saying, okay, it's worth it to us to try and go into this box and put forward our understanding and cross our fingers and hope that there is enough intelligibility that we can move forward in a, in a good way from this. Whereas others are taking the approach of not trying to enter that space. But then the challenge in that is if you don't engage in these trans-systemic conversations where there's a risk of misinterpretation, then, then what happens? No one does even try 
to engage in that sort of understanding. So personally, I see uh, a real, an important amount of work to be done to grapple through that question. And in my work so far, a lot of um, the community engaged indigenous law work I've done is more nations not interacting with the state and instead asserting their own water declaration or Oceans Act or environmental assessment procedure or uh, land code, or they're kind of trying to articulate these contemporary Indigenous legal instruments, but doing it before they need to go to court or before they need to enter a negotiation. Um, and so, yeah, I hope I, I can think or like come to a better understanding of how to work through that real stickiness. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Firstly, thanks so much for talking to us today. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, so I'm a first year student here and we've talked a bit about the Gladue system in my criminal law class. Um, and I'm really, I'm really just interested to hear any of your insights about specifically um, the option for community-based sentencing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any insights you may have about that? Yes. My favorite case on community-based sentencing is called Thomas and something. Yes. yes. Is this the one that's like Patchy Dot and the Dida Dot and the Esquimalt? I think so. So um, basically this case was these men from the Esquimalt nation, which is an urban nation near Victoria. They don't have their traditional land. Uh, territory anymore to hunt. And so they went up to Apache Dot, Dida Dot territory. I think it was just Dida Dot territory. And they hunted elk out of season and uh, didn't, didn't take all the meat with them and didn't have a prior agreement with the Dida Dot. And so a re so many harms occurred here across legal traditions, uh, Canadian law, Esquimalt law, and Dida Dot law. But the sentencing took entirely a uh, place within the Esquimalt and Dida Dot legal worlds, where it was held in the longhouse there, or the big house, and these men had to do all sorts of community service work. And then an agreement was negotiated where the Esquimalt were able to legally hunt in Dididot territory um, because of these men's mistake. And the Dididot recognized, oh, well, we have this land and we had these historic relationships. And so they figured out how to make uh, a, a way moving forward. And, uh, Professor Rebecca Johnson at UVic, who teaches criminal law, this is her favorite example of community sentencing, and it's my favorite too. And there's a great CBC News article that you can read more about it if you just look up Thomas and Norris, if that is the one, I think. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, we should email about it after. Yeah, mm -hmm. we can send it to you. Any other questions or? Would you mind? Um, yeah. You end your presentation on uh, your grandmother's words. You'll yeah. figure it out. Yeah. And I, I, I've had the chance to read her wonderful paper, but not perhaps not everybody has. So I wonder if you could sort of explain a little what she means and sort of the responsibility she puts on. Yeah. On you and others. Great. So it's this idea within. Anishinaabe teaching pedagogy that you give a lot of deference and respect to the learner. You don't try and uh, like beat the meaning over someone's head. You recognize that people are coming to this from their own place and their own perspectives. And so in trusting that others will come to arrive at their own conclusion allows for a type of learning to happen that is uh, quite organic and is uh, allows for more nuance and more complexity. And within the Anishinaabe language, um, there is this practice called um, perception ambiguity, where linguistically 
it allows you to um, say, say a phrase in a way that allows for just enough ambiguity that the person could read multiple different meanings into what you just said. And so here we see something, I think quite a different goal in communication. I think a real goal in English and in Canadian legal culture is certainty and efficiency. And the example I always love to give is in Anishinaabe when our word for blueberry pie is chigiyate, we went to Koshin and Abashkin and a second and chigiyate, Kwejigan, which is old time Frenchman exploding blueberries, blueberry sauce layered between things, bend over and put it in the oven bread. And then different communities have different ways of saying this. Um, and if you get even deeper, we went to which is Frenchman, Mitig is a stick or a tree. And way is the action of waving. So way metagoge is a stick waver, um, which referred to when the French came, they were missionaries. And that symbol of the cross was uh, how the Anishinaabe identified them. So there's so many layers to this single word, which is in fact, not a noun, it's a verb. And uh, it tells a story. And so if this is kind of what the language is, prioritizing and emphasizing, you can think about how in teaching, uh, if you want to be telling a story to people and painting a picture and not just like giving them the ratio, then it allows for a different type of learning experience to happen. And it can be very frustrating because sometimes you just want to know the answer. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering, thank you so much, first of all, for the wonderful talk. Um, I was just wondering if you had any, you know, recommendations about like Indigenous films or novels, because unfortunately, they're not a, a part of the mainstream, yeah. as you, you know, like novels or anything. I was wondering if you had any that you'd recommend that. for us to watch or check out. Yes, I do. Um, I think as a legal audience, one of a really interesting book of fiction is called The Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich. And it's not that old. It's in the last 10 years that it was published, but it tells the story of violence against women uh, on reserves. It's in the United States, but so many crossover lessons for Canada. But it tells that story through the lens of a 13-year-old boy uh, who is very playful, um, and he's grappling with these really hard issues and uh, challenges of jurisdiction on reservations in the United States and these jurisdictional kind of black holes that come forward that really harm Indigenous women in particular. But you can get through all of these really hard issues because this protagonist is so kind, you just love him. You just, you feel like you're his auntie. Um, and so that's a beautiful book, The Roundhouse. And then something more on the academic side, um, perhaps. Well, one that I teach from a lot is Canada's Indigenous Constitution. It's a 2010 publication, and I'm pretty sure it's the only one so far about it, uh, Indigenous law that's been translated in both English and French. And um, also, my dad wrote it, and so I think about Jean again, and how like not, none of his work would have been possible without Jean, and how maybe we all have these people in our life who we don't know their stories, but they've just made so much possible. And in a way, she's the a type of author of Canada's Indigenous Constitution. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. Um, I was just uh, wondering um, when you're talking about, you know, the organic kind of nature of, of cobwebs, um, it struck me that they're not organic. They're actually very planned by the spider. Uh, you know, each one is very individual to them, but, you know, if you tear it down, they're going to go and, and build another one over there that has a sort of similar symmetry and architecture. Um, to, to others that they build and they sort of construct it in different ways in different spaces. And so that just led me to wonder about then 
Um, do you have thoughts or vision on, you know, how uh, at this point in time, you know, at this moment in time that Indigenous legal traditions should be taught? Mm. Um, how should they be taught in uh, Canadian law schools or in this law school or law, law school? How should, you know, uh, not in 10 years time and not in 30 years time or 50 years time, but maybe now with a eye to the future, mm -hmm. thinking like the spider in the cobweb. Right. Well, I love that. Now I want to go and learn about how it is an individual spider web often the same as it was before? And then how does it change between species? But what it makes me think about how does it need to be taught indigenous law? I think it depends on who the professor is, who the teacher is, and that different people have different gifts and skills and connections. And so there's lots of ways to spin that web or to, to fulfill that call to action number 28. And we're seeing an emphasis, I think, on mandatory courses right now yeah. that are offered in a similar way to criminal law or property law or courts. And yeah, I, we don't have that at Queens and we're in conversations right now about what we should be doing. I don't, is that what I think is the most exciting way to learn Indigenous law? No, it's not at all. But is it important that Indigenous law is kind of seen as having a similar weight and importance to what else we see in the JD mandatory curriculum? Yes. And so how do we play with that? And then thinking about the demands it places on Indigenous legal scholars, if there's only two at the school to teach 200 students every year, this one particular class, and that might take them away from their actual research area. So there's challenges around it that I'm, yeah, I'm thinking through, but I do think an, an important perspective is the individual that's going to influence how it's taught. Yeah, thanks for that. Question about the legal camps: um, How how would um, students be able to attend those classes, and mm -hmm. is it available to everyone who's coming from different law schools? Yeah, so it's been run differently, but one of the primary models is that it's for first years, and that they, you can kind of take up to fifty people into a community in terms of community capacity and finances. Osga did a huge one this year at Rama, where I think they took 100 students um, and also had some U of P students join. But in some instances, we're seeing more of like an application. Uh, in some instances, we're seeing first come, first serve as they get to sign up. And, um, and then some, it's upper years who are taking it as like a, an elective course. So lots of different models. I'm gonna have to cut off the conversation here only because we run out of time, but I just wanted to thank you so much for your insights and bringing your grandmother's beautiful wisdom here. We're so grateful. Mm. It's not good for you. Thank Thanks you. Thank Thanks very much, everyone. I'm very sorry, but the caterer's car broke down. It was late. So please take some food before you go. Um, there's lots, so please enjoy.